In fact, it was my decision. She never asked to leave. How dark your baby is going to be? That conversation <laughs> I'm never going to share. Hey everyone, welcome to the Behavioral Arts. My name is Spidey and I use my degree in sociology and psychology, my certifications in criminal interrogation and body language analysis, and over 10 years experience as an award-winning mentalist to teach people practical psychology and behavioral analysis on stages and television shows all over the world. In this video, we are diving deep into the documentary Harry and Meghan on Netflix, and we are more specifically looking at episodes five and six where they really get into the controversial issues and we are seeing a ton of stuff with their body language, their facial expressions, and their word choice. Are these emotions we're seeing on Megan's face real? What does Harry really think of his brother's position on all this? And why did this edit of the Oprah interview absolutely blow my mind? Before we dive in, let me say this really quick. If you haven't seen parts one and two on the channel where I covered episodes one through four, don't worry about it. There isn't really any continuity. I might reference back every now and then for some behaviors, but it's totally fine to start with this one. With that being said, let's jump right in. People are still scratching their heads going, how would the male have the, either the stupidity or the whatever you want to call it to print a letter between a daughter and a father? Well, the answer is simple. They knew the family would encourage us not to sue. Okay, so there's quite a bit going on there with Harry's nonverbal communication, starting with something that my regular viewers know I just can't ignore, which is a good eyebrow flash. While he says the word stupidity while talking about the male, we see an eyebrow flash. The eyebrows go up really quick for a moment. Now, I'll leave a link in the description to a video that explains why we know this, but the research shows that when we see an eyebrow flash, in the middle of a conversation, it typically means one of three things. One is emphasis, one is social approval or social connection, and the third is surprise, when something's surprising. In this case, it's a classic example of eyebrow flash for emphasis. The thing that convinces me of that is as he's saying stupidity, we see a very slight forward and downward gesture with the head as if to affirm that's stupid. And we typically get that with emphasis when we wanna emphasize something we see these two gestures together. It's not exaggerated, but we see a slight gesture like that with his head. But then we see his eyes scan downwards, left and right, left and right, as he looks for the right word to say here and never finds it. Now, eye accessing cues, in other words, the direction that our eyes look, depending on what we're thinking of, are heavily debated in behavioral analysis. Even the guys who initially proposed the theory eventually went on to say that it's just massive generalizations and it's not really that dependable. However, one thing that I have found in my experience to be true and that a lot of behavioral analysts swear by is the fact that downwards with the eyes typically tends to be deeply emotional. And it's not even because of the eye accessing cues that I believe this, it's because typically when we're happy, things go up. We say, I jump for joy, I'm floating on cloud nine. We know that upwards is happy and we see this in body language. And we also know that sad things tend to be downwards. I'm feeling low, I'm feeling down. So I think it's not even just because we're accessing negative thoughts, but simply because with deep emotions, things tend to go downwards. And I do think he's quite emotional with this topic. It's getting him deeply emotional, which is why I think he's scanning down here for the right word. It has to be an intense word and he just doesn't find the right word. Maybe because any word he thought of isn't something he wants to say in a documentary. Finally, we're getting a lot of information here concerning Harry's baseline for hand movements because he's very animated here and he's talking with his hands a lot. And if you notice the orientation that his hands go in, there's a lot of the hands sideways like this, quite a bit of the palms up like this in the beginning and at the end, and there's a couple of gestures towards himself like this with his hands. Now in the research, hand gestures that are synchronized with what we're saying are referred to as illustrators because they illustrate what we're saying. But there's quite a bit of uncertainty about what the orientation of the hands mean. Because even across cultures, there seems to be preferences for hand orientation depending on the language that the person is speaking. For example, English speaking storytellers use sideways hand gestures a lot more than any other uh, orientation. Whereas for example, French storytellers use palms up way, way, way more than all the other gestures and way, way, way more than English speakers use palm up. So given that hand gestures seem to differ a lot between cultures, languages, and don't seem to be universal, 
there aren't too many things that we can rely on when it comes to interpreting what the orientation of the hand means. That being said, there are two orientations of the palms that seem to have a lot of agreement in the research and seem to be cross-cultural. One of them is palms up. There's a lot of research that finds that palms up means more or less the same thing and palm forward like this. In fact, I think that most of you will instinctively know exactly what this means. I don't think I need to say it. Regardless of which part of the world you're tuning in from, I think most of us get what this means. And we'll come back to that later because in this clip, we never saw him do this. His hands went in every direction, but never outwards. So that's really interesting for me. I'm gonna put a pin in that. So then let's talk about palms up because we do see that quite a few times here. And in the research, there seems to be quite a bit of agreement that palms up means one of two things. Either it's uncertainty, like you don't know, and we might see this with a shrug, like with a shrug, our hands often turn up. So that's a really good sign that it might be connected to uncertainty. And the second meaning is asking for something or offering something, so some sort of exchange. And this is something like we see in movies or plays, when you have a homeless person, they might come out with their hands out like this. And this is immediately nonverbal. We understand that they're asking for something, but we might also do it when we're offering something in conversation. So as a generalization, we can associate palms up to uncertainty or some sort of exchange. And with Harry, I think we're actually seeing both those things. In the beginning, he's talking about uncertainty. You know, people are wondering why would the male print such a thing? And we see that hand come up, which is very consistent with uncertainty, almost just a hand shrug. And then at the end, when he says, well, the answer is simple, we see those hands turn upwards. And I think it's him going, I'm, I'm giving you the answer here. I'm providing you the answer. It's a simple answer. All right, now we're gonna dive deeper and look at Harry's gestures and how they differ from what we just saw and what we've been seeing in the other episodes. We're gonna look at Megan's expressions of emotion and see what's going on with her and try to put all this together. But before we do, do me a huge favor, hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more behavioral analysis and practical psychology content. The main thing that we needed was, was some space, some space to think and just work out what, what on earth we're doing. Yeah, that was um, on the 1st of January. I came out refreshed and I was like, here we go, 2020. Yeah. What you got? There wasn't a single paparazzi that lives on Vancouver Island. That was the reason we chose it. It's an island. Okay, so now we're seeing something that isn't very characteristic of Harry, because not only in the clip we looked at earlier, but throughout this documentary, we rarely see those hands come outwards. He gestures a lot in all the orientations, but not this. But here, he's doing it quite a bit. And he's doing it in the beginning when he says, we just needed some space to think. And his hand is now outwards. Now, I told you earlier that this is one of the gestures with the hands that we have the most agreement on. And again, that I bet most of you can figure out what it is. Well, it's usually something that has to do with negation or interruption or stopping or rebelling or anything that has to do with like stop, no. So we often call these stop gestures, especially with the fingers out. So in this case, the reason that I believe his hand is coming outwards is because he says, you know, we just needed space to think. And I think he's thinking in his head, we just need a break. We needed to disconnect. We need to get away from it all. And then it cuts to scenes of him actually disconnecting. You know, he's in the water and he's just having a good time and he's just not part of that life that they were trying to get away from. Then we see him talk about actually coming out refreshed. And as he says, I came out refreshed. We see the eyes go up like this and that's very consistent. Remember earlier I said, you know, down is usually sad, deeply emotional, and up is happy. Well, that's what we call gravity defying with the eyes. When we go up like this, like, oh my God. Notice how you might see someone eat a dessert or something, oh my God. They don't even have to say it, just go like this, and you go, okay, they enjoy it. So his eyes are going up because this was a pleasant experience. Now, while he's saying that and the eyes go up, we also see this very clear no gesture. This can have a lot of meanings, but most commonly suggests disbelief, disappointment, disapproval or disagreement, one of those four. And in this case, I'm very familiar with this little cluster like this, and it's disbelief, but more specifically, you would not believe. So you might see someone come out of a massage and you go, uh, you know, how, how was it? How was your massage? And they might do this exact cluster and they go, oh my God, it was amazing. And this no is like, you would not believe how amazing it was. I don't have the words to tell you how amazing it was. It was an unbelievable experience. And that's what it is. It's disbelief or maybe more like unbelievable. 
there are two things here that just just made me smile and one of them is the what you got that little what you got at the end yeah what you got and i think he's in this headspace where he's like thinking about how he disconnected and he's comfortable so he's relaxing here as he thinks about that and we get this what you got and the second one is right at the end when he goes that's why we chose it it's an island that was the reason we chose it it's an island it's this sass that we've been seeing and I've been talking about in every part of this analysis that every now and then there's this sass that comes out of Harry and we even invented a term in the first part analysis which is the sassy bauble and we're seeing it right there at the end. It's an island. Like there's this bauble with his head and it's just so sassy. There are two reasons I believe we're seeing this relaxed sassiness with Harry here. The first one is, like I said earlier, he's talking about a time of his life where he disconnected, he felt refreshed and so I think he's actually going into the headspace and he's relaxing a little bit in front of the camera. The second one is something I've seen very often on sets. I've worked on a lot of television shows, a lot of reality shows, a lot of documentaries. And very often what you find is with time, as the people who are on camera get comfortable with crew members, get comfortable in the setting, they also get a lot more comfortable in front of the camera. They feel more relaxed. Even in a lot of YouTube videos, in the beginning, we see professional, calm, you know, direct, and by the end of it, there's a relaxation there. There's a little bit more fun. I just wanted all these cousins and these people. I just wanted all of that. So when I was pregnant with Archie, I was just so excited that we were going to be able to create for him that thing that I had always wanted. So I just did everything I could to make them proud and to really be a part of the family. So in part one of the analysis, we went into great depth about Megan's way of speaking and her mannerisms and how it naturally just rubs certain people the wrong way. And I went into great depth into the psychology as to why that is. And the feedback from you guys was incredible, so thanks for that. But this is another example of that. I can pretty much guarantee, and you guys can confirm this in the comments, that there are some people who look at this and go, oh, it's just a mom talking about a lovely, you know, vision that she had for her children. But there are some people who are just bothered or irked or irritated, and you may not even know why. So I don't want to reiterate all the things that we looked at in part one that make it so that she's irritating to certain people, even if they're not really sure why, uh, but I will add to it. And there's the fact that whenever she's talking almost about anything, there's a smile at almost all times. And we're going to go on to look at some clips here where she's talking about very sad things and that smile is still there. And naturally, we have an instinct to not trust people who always smile because in our head, we connect it to that salesman or you know those actors, those dramatic actors, or you see someone on an interview, you know, like on television, like a Hollywood interview, and they're always smiling. Even when they're talking about things that are sad, they always have this smile because it's all about how they're coming off, and it feels inauthentic to some people. Once again, I will say this again and again and again, I'm not saying that there's anything inherently wrong with this. Some people just speak this way. It could be her background in acting. It can also be very much related to the mannerisms and the way of speaking of her mother, who we see in this documentary, and she is also extremely animated with big inflections in her tone and the big gestures and the facial expressions. So it could very much be a family thing. It could be her history in acting. It could be the fact that she's a recent mother and she has this way of speaking, the way we speak to our children, but there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that certain people react to it a certain way. And we're seeing a lot of those things here. We're seeing that constant smile once again. We're seeing the really exaggerated facial expressions as she's thinking back and we're seeing that shift in cadence where she's getting really excited about this thought and, oh, that, and the reminiscent chuckle. I talk a lot about the reminiscent chuckle where we see her there, she's pausing and she's chuckling before she goes on with, you know, what she wanted and what she was thinking. And this to me always feels inauthentic. I've seen acting coaches teach their students that reminisce and chuckle, but most of the time it's more as a reaction, like someone's telling a story and you're sitting there and you're kind of remembering it along with them. But when I see someone with that chuckle before they say something, to me it feels very unnatural. When we're talking, usually, once again, our illustrators are very synced with what we're saying. So as we say something and we recall something pleasant, it might happen in the middle of our sentence, but to have it there before we talk, 
to me, it just feels inauthentic. Looking at some more body language, right at the end when she says to really be a part of the family, we see a very distinct shrug. We see the shoulders shrug and at the same time, the eyebrows go up. And last week we talked a lot about shrugs and I've even made a completely separate video, a really quick one that goes into the science of shrugs and that's on the channel. But in this case, what we're seeing is an attitudinal shrug, which denotes the incapacity or something being out of our hands. So if you ask me something, I go, it's out of my hands. I don't know. You might see me shrug and that's what I think this is because she's saying she did everything she could to be part of the family and I think this is her saying it, it wasn't in my hands. Uh, I couldn't really do anything about it. I was not the one who made the decision to not really be included in the family. And this relates to some really interesting word choice that we have here. She says, I did everything I could to make them proud and to really be part of the family. So I just did everything I could to make them proud and to really be a part of the family. Uh, and this one to me isn't a great look, not because of what I think, but because of things that she herself has said in the past. When she met the queen, she was unprepared. She was also a little awkward around uh, Prince William and Princess Catherine when she first met them. This is her admission. She said these things. So you can argue that it was never meant to be offensive. She was just ill prepared. But to me, that contrasts with I did everything I could to really be part of the family because everything and really are both very extreme words. So I'm not saying you did nothing, but I certainly wouldn't say you did absolutely everything you could because someone who did everything they could, the moment they started dating Harry, would ask him these questions. Hey, when I meet your grandma, when I meet your brother and your sister-in-law, what do I do? How do I behave? What's the right protocol? Is there something I can read? You know, a lot of you once again said she was given that folio. She could have read through it in preparation. Fine, she didn't know she was gonna meet the queen, maybe, but she could have still been prepared for that eventual case. That would be doing everything. I've seen little cartoons of me on all fours with her um, holding a dog lead and me wearing the dog collar. How predictable that, you know, the woman is to be blamed for the decision of a couple. In fact, it was my decision. She never asked to leave. I was the one that had to see it for myself, but it's misogyny at its best. I want to start off by making it unambiguously clear that I don't think that bullying is ever okay. And I really respect this community enormously for this. I know that a lot of you don't like them. You're not okay with the lies they've told. You're not okay with a lot of their behaviors. And you've expressed that in the comments, but very eloquently. But there's never a circumstance where I think that demeaning things like that are appropriate. You could say that there are circumstances where she's been a bully, so she deserves it, but I also don't believe in retaliation or an eye for an eye. I don't believe in that. I believe in taking the higher ground. If there's something that you have a problem with, speak up, talk about it. I can't imagine what it would have been like for him to, as a father, as a member of the royal family, forget politics, forget the fact that they left. He's still related by blood to royalty as a human being. I can't imagine what it must have felt like for him to see such a demeaning image. And I can be sympathetic to the human without being sympathetic to his position on a lot of things. And having said that, I do believe that he's being deceptive about quite a few things here. Um, before I go into that, really quick, the lie detection disclaimer, in a nutshell, um, there is no amount of behavior you can ever see on someone that would allow you to know for sure that someone is lying. There's nothing but there are certain behaviors that happen more often in stress or when our mind slows down to make up something because telling the truth is much easier. So when we see a lot of these behaviors happen at the same time, it's called a cluster of deception and it just lets us know that we need to ask a few more questions here, but it never says with certainty that someone's being deceptive. So in this case, for me, it indicates that I'm not so sure I would want to ask more questions, but I can't guarantee you that this is deception. Here's what those behaviors are. First of all, I bet a lot of you notice this, um, that there's a, not only a crossed arms, because that doesn't mean much, but a specific kind of crossed arms. So crossed arms typically like this, it's not a big deal. Let me show you what I mean. Like this crossed arms, not a big deal. A lot of people sit like this when it's cold or for, you know, just cause it's comfortable, even for self comforting sometimes, it doesn't mean a whole lot. Unless you're seeing a bunch of other stuff, I would never give this importance. But notice how him and I, pretty much have the same amount of our body in the frame, but you can't see my arms. 
you can certainly see his. They're higher up. And not only are they higher up, we've seen him cross his arms a lot of other times in this documentary. It doesn't look the same. Typically, it's a little bit lower and it's literally crossed like this. One's like a weave. Whereas in this case, it's not. One's going across like this, gripping up here, and the other one's under it. And this is more consistent, what we call a self-hug. Usually it's done more for self-reassurance. And we kind of feel it here. It's a little bit tighter. It's not this relaxed, you know, crossed arms. It feels like a, a self-comforting hug. Then we get a lot of very clear lip activity. There's a very clear uh, lip lick, which is when the tongue comes out really quickly and licks the lips. This is very associated with stress because when we're stressed, the mouth dries out and this brings color to the lips. Then we see a very quick lip retraction as well. This is when the lips go inwards like this. And lip retraction when it's held like this typically is consistent with withheld opinion. Something we're not saying, we're literally, you know, closing our mouth because there's something we don't want to say. But when it's done quickly like that, sometimes it's a variation of licking the lips because the lips go inwards for the tongue to just quickly moisten them like this and they come back out. There's another potential uh, licking of the lips that might be hidden with an edit because they switch angles and when they go to the second angle, we catch it for a millisecond, but his tongue is going back in. And if I pause it there, you might see the moment where the tongue is still out a little bit. So I think there was another lip lick there, but with an edit, they were able to hide that. There's a fourth lip lick that looks a little bit different than most lip licks. And it's, we see the tongue coming out the side and it doesn't quite look the way it would with licking of the lips. With the licking of the lips, the tongue is usually very flat and it just does this. It goes in and out, but it's flat, it's relaxed. In this case, it's not. It's tense and it's sticking out the side. So it's not exactly a lip lick. That's more consistent with something called a tongue jut. And this is something where the tongue tends to be a little bit more stiff and it pops out and we usually do this when we're getting away with something or we almost got away with something. We often see this in someone who just, you know, they're caught and you see this kind of thing and the, like this, the, the tongue comes out and is caught between the teeth. Some analysts associate this also to disgust, like trying to push out a disgusting thought. Could be, but it's very consistent with getting away with something. Next, we see a lot of activity with the eyelids. The blink rate is through the roof and in that very high blink rate, we're getting a lot of these little bursts of flutters. An increased blink rate is consistent with stress. When we're stressed, our blink rate goes up because the eyes dry out and we tend to blink a lot more. Uh, and flutters are usually something we do when we're processing, when we're processing information, thinking about something. So again, we tend to associate this with stressful or deceptive behavior because the mind is being overworked and we're seeing stress. Oh, by the way, before you take to the comments, if any of what I just said is something that you do a lot of when you're being honest, like, you know, maybe you lick your lips a lot because they're dry more often than other people, or maybe your blink rate is a little bit higher than most people, like mine is because I wear hard contact lenses, it doesn't matter. You know, because I get this comment a lot like, oh, that's all deceptive. I do that when I'm not being deceptive. So there's two things to very much keep in mind. One is baseline. If you do something very regularly or very often, it's part of your baseline. It doesn't matter. We're talking about behaviors that are out of the ordinary. So for him, all these things don't happen often. And the second thing is clusters. You know, there's really nothing wrong with at some point starting to blink a little bit more. Maybe some cut in your eye or maybe the sun's in your eye. It doesn't really matter. The reason we look for clusters is because when we see all these things happening together, they increase our confidence specifically because they're happening together. One at a time, isolated behaviors really don't mean that much when it comes to this kind of thing. So what is all this telling me in this context? Personally, I'm not so sure that this was entirely his idea, that she had nothing to do with it. Maybe it was a bit of both. Maybe she suggested like, you know, maybe we need to get away from things or it'd be really nice to get away from things. And then he was the one who made that decision to say, okay, we're going to get out of here because I'm, I'm seeing this for myself. But I really don't think that she had no part to play in this. I will also say this. It's very possible that it's not deception, uh, that it's actually just stress. Obviously, he's very self-conscious talking about this. He's stressed. You know, that, that caricature probably makes him feel very little about himself. So it makes sense that he would have a self-reassuring hug, that we would see that stress, that we would see the processing. So that's what I'm saying. These clusters indicate a heightened probability of deception where we might want to ask more questions, 
but definitely not certainty because it could just be stress and self-awareness. But these secondary accounts, it's about hatred. It's about, you know, you know race. And the focus was predominantly on Megan. And then also there would be derogatory terms where they would use the N-word um, on tweets. The seriousness. Okay, again, I'm gonna tread very softly here because just like bullying, racism is something I absolutely do not take lightly. Let's talk about Christopher Boozy. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Christopher Boozy, the expert witness for this, for what was happening on social media, is a very controversial topic. And my friend Nate the Lawyer, right here on YouTube, who's a brilliant YouTuber, made an entire video talking about why a lot of what this gentleman has said doesn't hold up, doesn't make sense. And in this documentary, he spends a whole lot of time talking about how there was a coordinated attack on Twitter, on Meghan Markle, that a lot of the activity was coming from a small number of accounts that his company was able to find. But there's an article in Newsweek, which I will link in the description, where Twitter flat out denied that. And they said that of the 55 accounts that he reported as being suspicious, they only took action on four of them. So Twitter themselves wasn't really saying the same thing that he's saying, even in this documentary. But I'll leave a link in the description to Nate's video on this. He goes into an amazing amount of detail and you can make your own decision. You can look at it and go, no, you know what? I think what, what Mr. Boozy is saying is right. Or you can look at it and go, mm, there's just too much here that I'm just not buying. But I'm not gonna talk about that segment and that controversy, because again, Nate did a great job. Uh, I'm gonna talk about this segment. So notice how he's talking about the online hatred, then he brings up the subject of race. And notice what happens before he says the word race. It's about, you know, you know race. There's a big hesitation. We see that kind of, it's not a no gesture, it's more of like this kind of, almost like an internal struggle we're seeing there to kind of push that word out. He says, you know, you know, which is speech fluency. He's having a hard time getting those words out. We see a slow blink and we see the lips come together for a second and compress for a quick second. It's almost like he's having a hard time or doesn't quite want to say this word. So we're seeing this struggle to bring the race subject up. And is it because he's uncomfortable with the subject? Is it because he knows that it's a position that's difficult to prove? Well, let's take a look. First of all, before we look at this, let me say this. I think that any person of color on social media or out there in the public is going to get X amount of racist comments. It's stupid, it's ridiculous, but it's out there. To prove that there was targeted racism against Meghan Markle, you have to prove that there was more than that baseline of idiots who have nothing better to say than racist comments. So let's look at the posts that are supporting this claim that there was an attack on Megan based on race. So the first one seems to be an Instagram post of the family celebrating Kwanzaa, which is an African-American holiday. And yeah, I would classify this as racist, touching on race. I wouldn't say it's racist necessarily towards Megan or demeaning Megan for a skin color, but there is a racist element to this. So that's one. Next, we have a post that mentions race, but I wouldn't classify as racist. She's being called an opportunist for taking advantage of her skin color to gain sympathy from people. So I don't classify this post, the second one that they showed, as being overly racist. It is, it is negative towards Megan, but I don't see it as being focused on her race to demean her. Then we have this third one, which is undeniably racist. But I mean, look at it, what, what, what the hell is this? It's a YouTube comment with six likes. So it's basically an idiot who said something stupid and found six idiots to like the comment. But again, this is something that almost anyone of color is gonna get stupid comments like this. It's not indication of a big coordinated racist attack. And finally, they show one more post at the end while he's still talking about race. And I don't see a single element of racism in that. In fact, she's called about a million names. Look at this, a million things. None of them has a thing to do with race. This is very hateful. It's, it's really negative, 
but it doesn't even slightly mention race. So my question is, why aren't we seeing dozens or hundreds of posts to support what he's saying? There's other points in the documentary where, you know, they talked about the hate that she got, and we're seeing dozens and dozens of posts go by where they're showing publications to support what they're saying. Why aren't we seeing that here? We're seeing four measling posts. One of them has absolutely nothing to do with race. So, so what's going on? I'm led to believe that one of two things is happening. The first is that there just wasn't more racist comments towards Megan than any other person of color. That there wasn't, in fact, this massive racist wave. That's one. And the second thing is that there was, in fact, a lot of racism, but the editors of this documentary are really bad at their jobs because they couldn't go and find, or maybe not the editors, the, the researchers or whoever was getting the, the, the screenshots to support what's being said are really bad at their jobs because they couldn't go find all these racist comments that are out there. Please report it to head of security immediately. It just said, Megan just needs to die. Someone needs to kill her. Maybe it should be me. And he's just like, okay. That's like what's actually out in the world. And I'm a mom. It's my real life. You know, and that's the piece when you see it and you go, you are making people want to kill me. It's not just a tabloid. It's not just some story. That's real. Are my babies safe? because you're bored or because it sells your papers or it makes you feel better about your own life. It's real what you're doing. And that's the piece I don't think people fully understand. Okay, so, so far we've talked a lot about how certain people just don't like Megan because of her mannerisms, the way she speaks, they see her as fake, they see her as overdramatic and she just irritates them. And other people really like Megan for whatever reason they connect with her and they wish her the best, and they're, they're, they're behind her 110%. I think that this clip that we just saw is probably the most polarizing clip in the entire documentary. I think those who don't like Megan are looking at this going, I can't believe anybody would buy this. It just looks so fake. And I think those who support Megan are looking at this exact same clip going, I can't believe anybody would doubt this. Look at her, she's falling apart, she's so emotional. So. There's a reason for that. There are elements to this that could be argued for either side. There are things here that look and feel real and there are things here that look and feel fabricated. So what you focus on is how you're gonna interpret the entire thing. It depends on the goggles that you're putting on. So let's talk about this. Sorry, I'm gonna go a little back and forth here because I'm kind of debating myself. So let's start with the fact that she just has that Meghan Markle way of saying things. Even when she's seemingly emotional, she still has that, those dramatic pauses and those, those, that emphasis that kind of seems like a movie scene. On the other hand, we're seeing little bursts here of sadness that we haven't seen in other overly dramatic scenes that she has. So every now and then, it's subtle, it's not much, so that's why I'm back and forth about this. We see those eyebrows come together and up. Now it's not held, it's not a big moment, and, we're not, and, and we do see the line down the middle here and the, the lines at the top of the forehead, but not enormously so. So is it there? Yes. Is it super obvious and really emotional the way it should be? No. Is it possible that she's had certain procedures that would limit the movement up there, like Botox? Yes. So you see what I'm saying? It's hard to know if that's real sadness, if the Botox is limiting it, if it's not real sadness, because just these little bursts. Then we have the fact that she's actually crying. And I know, I know that the critics are gonna say, of course, well, she's an actress. She could cry whenever she wants to. I think people have a misconception of how much mastery over their emotions and facial expressions actors have. Most actors that I've worked with don't go, okay, I'm supposed to be sad in this scene, so I'm gonna go get the eyebrows where they're supposed to and I'm gonna droop my mouth. They don't do that. They just get into the scene, they feel the moment, they really feel their character and they let the emotions come out. That's what makes them great actors. And Megan is not an exceptional actor. She's not an Oscar winning actor. She's a good actress. She's good at what she does, but I've never seen anything from her that made me go, oh my God, wow, performance of the century. But then on the other hand, we have the fact that she's talking about the threats on her life and she goes randomly, I'm a mom. That's a call for sympathy. That's trying to get sympathy from all the moms. It doesn't really belong in this. 
Eventually, she goes on to say, you know, I'm scared for my life, for my children. In that context, it makes a little more sense. She's saying all the things that she's concerned about. But when she's talking about that death threat, she just throws in this random, I'm a mom, I see it as a call for sympathy. But then on the other hand, we have moments where her voice is quivering as, as it's coming out. She has that trembling in her voice. And again, you can be a great actor, that's not something that's really easy to fake. It actually happens when her emoting and she's got, you know, that, that was an example of really bad acting, but she's got that trembling in her voice. You know, and that's the piece when you see it and you go. So is it real? Is it fake? Once again, I think it depends on the goggles you have on. As for me, my position on this is the following. I absolutely think that there was a real fear there. When she saw the death threats, I believe there was a real fear. I believe there was a real sadness. It'd be hard to imagine not being sad or not being scared. I think there was absolutely something real. I just think it's important for her here to sell it right. So I think the base of it is real, but she's throwing some sprinkles on top and really trying to sell how emotional this is. And that's where we're getting these little seesaw back and forth. That's what I think. There's a conversation about how dark your baby is going to be? That conversation <laughs> I'm never going to share. Okay, so this was, this was the most aggravating aggravating clip that I saw in the entire series for two reasons. First, I was so upset at the editing here because I immediately recognized that that there's some tricky stuff going on, that that answer does not belong to that question because I've seen the Oprah interview numerous times enough to know that. But the second reason this aggravated me is because I had to go rewatch the entire Oprah interview to find both these segments, the question and that answer because I wanted to talk to you guys about it and I wanted to actually find the clips to support what I'm saying. So I had to sit through the whole thing again and oh, okay. So here's my frustration and, and they know what they're doing, man. They know what they're doing. That first question that Oprah asked where it's super dramatic, there's a conversation about how dark your baby is going to be. Like that's such a dramatic question, it's a dramatic statement. But why is it not being shown? Why is it? being played on a screen like that, where we're kind of watching it through someone's cupboard? Um, well, because it's highly edited. First of all, they cut a sentence out. That's not one long sentence. Megan actually in the middle of that says, with Harry. So that's one thing. And then second of all, the answer they show Harry give, it was not an answer to that question. Harry wasn't even there when that question was asked. So let's take a look at the original question and notice two things. One that Megan actually interrupts that question and then Megan's answer to it. Here it is. There's a conversation it. with you. With Harry. About how dark your baby is going to be? Potentially and what that would mean or look like. Ooh. There's a conversation it. about how dark your baby is going to be? That conversation <laughs> I'm never going to share. See, so she does interrupt her and then she says potentially or what that would mean and look like. So Oprah goes on to ask again in different words and let's look at Megan's answer the second time. If he were to brown, that that would be a problem. Are you saying that? I wasn't able to follow up with why, but that if that's the assumption you're making, I think that feels like a pretty safe one. I wasn't able to follow up with why but if that's the assumption you're making, I think that feels like a pretty safe one. So why am I accentuating these random words? Well, that's an extremely low confident answer. I think that feels, so it might not be right, but it feels like a pretty safe one. Not a safe one, not a definitely safe one. So that's three words in one sentence, Plus, she's not even the one saying it. She's spinning it on Oprah. Like if that's your assumption, I think that feels like a pretty safe one. So we're never actually getting an answer from Megan. Just these really sneaky kind of suggestions that she's putting this idea out there, but admittedly within this answer, she's saying she wasn't present for this conversation and she never followed up on this conversation. So that's exactly why they're showing us this question that Oprah asked, as opposed to on a screen, they're showing it to us like we're, we're, we're hiding in someone's closet because they're cutting out a sentence. They're, what, what Megan says, you know, that it was actually Harry having this conversation. If they cut that out and showed us the screen, there's no way to edit that 
to where we wouldn't notice that they cut something out. But this way, like think about what they have to do there. They have to extract the audio clip, then they have to find, because you're seeing the side of Oprah's hair. So they have to find a clip where we see Oprah's hair for quite some time, cutting the audio over that and do this really creative thing to where they're being dramatic and we're kind of looking at the side of a screen. But it's all to mask the fact that they butchered that question and that answer. Then they cut to an answer that Harry gave about 45 minutes after that one. So let's look at the question and answer on that one. Megan shared with us that there was a conversation with you about Archie's skin tone. Mm -hmm. What was that conversation? That conversation <laughs> I'm never going to share. Megan told us that there was a conversation about your baby's skin tone. Tell us about that conversation. And that's where Harry answers that conversation I'm never going to share. So why didn't they just keep that clip, that whole clip? Why did they have to really mess with that other question and then bring in Harry's answer? Well, first of all, I think the way she asked it that second time is less dramatic. It's, there's less emphasis, there's less drama, there's less of us going, oh my God, what's the scoop here? Second, she's saying, Megan told us. So again, she's suggesting that, May, you know, we had this conversation with Megan, but she didn't seem to have the answer, so now I'm asking you. And so they've taken this question, this dramatic question, and they've spliced in this more certain answer. That conversation, which definitely happened, that's the undertone, I'm never going to share. More drama. We're creating more drama here because Megan's answer, there was uncertainty. There wasn't a real answer. Plus there was an admission that it wasn't a conversation she was present for. So there's all these questions. So, well, why didn't you find out more? Why didn't you ask more questions? So why is this irritating me as much as it is? Well, first of all, the inauthenticity for me is too much to ignore. We're getting clues here that these documentary makers have no problem misrepresenting things for dramatic effect. But second of all, in an interview with Tom Bradby during his book tour, his recent book tour, uh, Prince Harry, the, the subject was brought up that during the Oprah interview, um, they suggested or said that there was racism in the royal family and Harry denied it. He said, no, the, the media said that. We never said that. We never made the claim that they were racist or that there was any racism coming from the royal family. In the Oprah interview, you accuse members of your family of racism. You don't even... No, we well, of... The British press said that. Right. I... Did, did Meghan ever mention that they were racist? She said there were troubling comments about yeah, Archie's skin There was skin concern color. about his skin color. Right. Wouldn't you describe that as essentially racist? I wouldn't, not having lived within that family. But forget the Oprah interview. If if for a second, let's just put it aside for a second. You had creative input on this documentary and you allowed this segment to air this way to where you're being asked about this racist conversation and you're saying that's a conversation I'm never going to share. And it's even being edited in a way to make it even more dramatic, to suggest that there was this big conversation that you don't want to share and you were okay letting that air. So we have very suggestive language in the Oprah interview where, yeah, Megan really danced around it. When all the news came out saying, oh my God, they're saying the royal family is racist. I didn't see you deny that claim then. Now in the documentary, you're playing that clip. You're allowing that clip to play. And then you're going on a book tour and you're saying, you never said that the royal family was racist. So. Listen, there's been a lot of things where I've defended them. There's been a lot of things where I tried to stay objective and look at it from both ways. I can't see it here. There's no part of me that's going to see how this deceptive editing here wasn't used to very much suggest something that he immediately went on a book tour after this documentary and denied. Like this took effort. There was a team of people who sat down around the table and said, how do we play that clip from Oprah without making it seem like we edited it. That, that dramatic question, and they thought about it. Someone went, ooh, I know. Let's set up the camera like it's this candid, you know, over the shoulder, like we're looking past the corner and we only see the side of the TV. Then we can edit it to misrepresent which clip it was. This took thought and effort. It's not a fluke. And you were okay with that. Tell me about going back. It was hard, especially spending a time having chats with my brother and my father who just, you know, were very much um, focused on the same misinterpretation of the whole situation. I've had to make peace with the fact that probably never gonna get 
genuine accountability or a genuine apology. Okay, got to move on from that whole editing thing. Um, so here he's talking about going back and facing his brother and his father. And there's a lot of stuff that suggests a lot of stress about this situation. First of all, uh, notice how when he says that, you know, when they were focused on the misrepresentation of the whole situation, notice his cadence up until that point, and then it all speeds up and fades away. So he's saying they were focused on the misrepresentation of the whole situation. So it kind of fades and it's really fast. Focused on the same misinterpretation of the whole situation. And this is really consistent with someone who's just trying to get past something, he's trying to get past a statement. And it could be because he doesn't want to revisit it, or it could also be because it doesn't reflect exactly what is true and he just wants to get past it. It could be either one. It's not enough for me to tell you he's lying about that. But after that, we see quite a bit of stuff. Uh, we see some pacifying with the hands, and this is one of the most reliable signs of body language. In the literature, it has different names, pacifying, adapting, self-soothing gestures, but it's any repetitive massage type gesture that is meant to calm us down, soothe. So we see a lot of that. Um, we see that downward gaze again. On numerous occasions, his eyes are just kind of looking downwards. And once again, this is, I think, the only orientation of the eyes that I give weight to, which is downwards typically tends to be deeply emotional. I mean, even intuitively, you see someone talking like this, it tends to look emotional. So we're seeing a little bit of that. There's an eye block, so or a slow blink rather, more or less same thing. So that slow blink usually denotes something that we're having a hard time facing, having a hard time dealing with. Um, we see mouth blocking, you know, with the fingers, the fingers are coming up to block the mouth. So there's a lot going on here that would indicate uh, stress. And you know, I say this a lot. In this case, is it a misrepresentation of what happened? It very well can be. It could be that they weren't quite as stubborn as he's saying, you know, especially with that mouth block, like when he's talking about it, like when he's saying, I'm never going to get an apology and his mouth blocking. Well, it's possible that's not entirely true. Maybe he did get some form of apology. It just wasn't good enough for him. Could be deception. It can also just be enormous amounts of stress when he's revisiting that um, moment, that, that conversation that he had. So in an interview or interrogation, these would just tell me to ask a little more questions about this topic. I would personally be curious, and this is experience speaking, about this apology that he never got. Um, I would dig a little deeper on that. I would say something like, did you get some form of apology from one or the other? Or uh, something called a double bind where I would go, which of the two do you feel was a little bit more apologetic? Because in, in answering that question, we're moving towards getting the information as to whether there was an apology or not. A double bind is a question where you present two options, but either option is a confession. It moves towards where we're trying to get. So I'm going to ask something like that. I think that's such a great way to end this. This whole journey that we've had together, I would want to ask more questions. I think that's the subtitle of my experience with uh, Harry and Megan. Because, yeah, there are things they've just flat out been deceptive about. There are things that I suspect they're being deceptive about. And then there are times where I think they're just being normal or they're just being themselves and they get a lot of hate because people have these their deceptive lens on. So if we try to stay in the middle, there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of things that I would like to ask them. For me, obviously, that, that really tricky editing of the Oprah clip, plus other moments, not as dramatic, but other moments where I felt editing was hiding certain things with this documentary, I feel like this is quite one-sided. Overall, that's where I'm going to land on this documentary specifically, especially because there's things that they're doing in it that, you know, there, there's, there's controversy out there about. Like Christopher Boozy, who's bringing up things that even Twitter has denied. Uh, and then, you know, again, this I, I'm just never going to get past this editing thing with the Oprah clip. I think we just need to deal with that. So yeah, a lot of things that I'm not a huge fan of. But overall, uh, you know, I love the conversations we're having, honestly. There, there's a lot of great open conversations in the comments. I hope we keep doing that with this video. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this, and I will see you on the next one.